So this uh, episode was aired on the last Christmas of the 1950s, and anybody was home Christmas Day for a late supper or a second meal of the day, watched this and said uh, said to herself, "This this is probably uh, how Twilight Zone is going to be from from now on." And boys, it was a stunningly good episode, one of my top ten favorites. People don't talk about it too much, but it's based on uh, an old outsta- outstanding science fiction magazine story um, uh, by Lewis Paget, uh, Henry Cutner and C.L. Moore. Now, this one is what you need. Now, it's a 12-episode <coughs> of the second season of TC, TZ, and again, based on the Paget story. The original story, of course, was by, by uh, Nathan Van uh, Cleave, and... Uh, with uh, Steve Cochran at Fred Renard, Ernest Tuck, uh, Truex as uh, Pido, the beautiful Arlene Sachs as Girl in the, uh, in the Bar, and Reed Morgan as Lefty. Now, in the plot of this one, a peddler named uh, Pido, or P- uh, Pidot, who carries a case of items from which he can give people what they need before they need it. According to Rod Serling's opening uh, narration, who did the teleplay, you're looking at Mr. Fred Renard, who carries on his shoulder a chip the size of a national debt. This is a sour man, a friendless man, a lonely man, a grasping, compulsive, nervous man. This is a man who has lived 36 undistinguished, meaningless, pointless, failure-laden years, and who at this moment looks for an escape, any escape, any way, anything, anybody, to get out of the rut. And this little old man is just what Mr. Renard is uh, waiting for. Now, uh, in this one, when the Pidot, or Pido, enters the bar, he gives a woman a vial of cleaning fluid, and an impoverished ex-baseball player, a bus ticket, Scranton, Pennsylvania. Moments later, the latter receives a phone call over the payphone, inviting him to accept a coaching position for a team at Scranton. After noticing a spot in his jacket that he wishes to remove before heading there, the woman with the cleaning fluid helps him and the pair become attracted to each other. Smiling what happened, a frustrated, arrogant, unsuccessful man named Fred Renard, who Searling mentions in the opening narrations, asks his pedo, to give him what he needs and receives a pair of scissors. Renard soon uses them to cut himself free after his scarf gets caught in a set of elevator doors. When he again demands something he needs from Pido, he receives a leaky fountain pen, which predicts a winning racehorse after his last drop of ink falls on a newspaper racing column. Now, unable to use the pen to predict any future winners, Renard angrily confronts Pido, who reveals that he only provides items that people need to use once, and then he cannot supply things such as serenity and peace of mind. Renard demands Pido provide him with another thing he needs, causing the latter to nervously glance at his case. Assuming the glance has indicated what he needs, he seizes a pair of shoes there uh, and puts them on, only to find out they are too tight and have slippery soles. When Pido says they're actually what he needs, Renard advances on him but slips on wet pavement and is struck and killed by a passing car. Pido then reveals he had foreseen his own death, and allowed Renard to steal the shoes to prevent it. As he leaves, he gives a comb to a man who uses to neaten his hair before he and his wife were photographed for a news story on the accident. And basically, the Pido character says, it's what I needed in the moment. And the closing narration by Rod goes like this. Street scene, night, traffic accident. Victim de- named Fred Renard, gentleman with a sour face who in contentment came with difficulty. Fred Renard, who took all that was needed in the Twilight Zone. Now, the original story featured a machine that could foretell an individual's probable future. In the story, the man owns a shop where where he has such a machine, and it gives people what they need to provide the best possible outcomes. Also, the Renard character is killed not by a car, but by falling off a subway platform while a train is coming into the station. This version of the story aired on a 52 episode of Tales of Tomorrow, changing the death of Renard character from a fall to being hit by a car. For his version, Serling replaced the science fiction element with a street peddler who could magically perform the same function. The final shot before the first com- uh, commercial, where Serling is concluding his narration, is actually played backwards. Looking carefully, one can see smoke returning to Renard's cigarette. Now, During the scene in which Mr. Renard's hotel room, a bellhop brings him a newspaper. He then opens it and spreads it out on the floor. The movement is quick, but the front page of the newspaper is visible, indicating that it's the same front page used in another Twilight Zone episodes, Time Enough at Last, 
The headline reads, H-bomb capable of total destruction. Once Renard opens the paper and look at the, looks at the racing page, several in-jokes or Easter eggs are apparent to the names of the listed jockeys, which include Searling, Clemens, referencing director of photography George Clemens, Houghton, referencing producer Buck Houghton, Butler, uh, referencing set director Rudy Butler, and Deneau, referencing assistant director Edward Deneau. Another Easter egg is where the Arlene Sachs character asks the the uh, uh, the uh, Bedou character for some matches, and of course there was major cigarette sponsorship for uh, for a Twilight Zone. So in every Twilight episode, Zone episode, you see someone smoking a cigarette. Now, why why it really works here, ladies and gentlemen, because when you have a character like Pedo or Pedot, there's different pronunciations. I apologize. If he knows what's going on, he's not going to tell the person and give it away. Like, he's very, very structured. It's almost like a card-playing game. See, I saw this episode first in its edited format uh, in Canada, but the the extended syndicated version is much, much interesting. Uh, you get the, the Arlene Sachs character basically uh, reflecting the fact, like a longer scene with the... The, the former Chicago Cubs player. And Arlene Sachs, my God, she was in the 22 as well. She was probably one of the most beautiful episodic actresses of the modern era. Of course, in Star Trek, uh, Spock's wife, you might as well say. And uh, But uh, Ernest True, uh, True X, if uh, going back a little bit of his uh, career, a very, very strong actor, he had started his career in pretty well the early 20s and uh, by the time he became a great uh, respected actor he w- went back to silent films he uh, became uh, a character actor in numerous uh, movies including the adventures of marco polo uh, a very popular uh, uh, movie at the time but mostly b-level movies but what he did in the, in the, uh, star trek the christmas day episode will never be forgotten forgotten because it was a, a, a kind of a kind of a, of a he played in every character, as we say, but mostly again B level acting, uh, through the years. Now um, uh, he unfortunately passed away on June 26, 73, at the age of eighty three. Um, anyway, his most famous role, of course, was in the title role of Alfred Hitchcock's *The Trouble with Harry*, as Harry, the corpse dragged all over the countryside by several other characters in this film. Now. Uh, now, uh, Philip had expected to have substantial lines to speak in the role, but uh, uh, this was his son, of course. But Hitchcock decided to kill off the character of Harry before he could utter one word. After this disappointment, his son decided to give up acting completely and turn his hand to landscape gardening. Now, that, now that's a typical Hollywood story, from the dead, dead body in a Hitchcock movie to Gardner. <laughs> so... So, ladies and gentlemen, what you need, again, a five-star episode of Twilight Zone. It's very subtle, but very, very uh, uh, distracting in its honesty. And Otter and Arlene Sachs is not a recognizable actor in it because True X wasn't as recognizable to the modern actors as he was back in the day. But, uh, you know, if you're, if you're a big fan of Arlene Sachs, who we've covered here in previous podcasts, give it a watch. It's, it's great. Have a good one. Bye.